वेलकम बैक टू कार्डियोवेड इन दिस एपिसोड वी आर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द एफ एफ आर और द फ्रैक्शनल फ्लो रिजर्व बट बिफोर दैट इफ यू आर न्यू टू दिस यूट्यूब चैनल और द पॉडकास्ट वी एट कार्डियोवेड रूटीनली डिस्कस द रिसेंट गाइडलाइंस द रिसेंट आर्टिकल्स फ्रॉम लीडिंग जर्नल्स इन कार्डियोलॉजी एंड रिसेंट एडवांस इन कार्डियोलॉजी अलॉन्ग विद बेसिक्स ऑफ जनरल कार्डियोलॉजी इंटरवेंशनल कार्डियोलॉजी एंड कार्डियक इमेजिन यू कैन कंसिडर सब्सक्राइबिंग द चैनल एफ एफ आर हैज बीन डिफाइंड एज द रेशियो ऑफ फ्लो डिस्टल टू स्टेनोट लीजन टू एक्सपेक्टेड नॉर्मल फ्लो इन एबसेंस ऑफ लीजन बट इज मेजरिंग द फ्लो दैट इज इन कैथला प्रॉब्लम नो वी यूज द प्रिंसिपल बिहाइंड ओम्स लॉ विच डिस्क्राइब द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन प्रेशर फ्लो एंड रेजिस्टेंस ओम्स लॉ इज द हिमोडाइनमिक बेसिस फॉर फ्रैक्शनल फ्लो रिजर्व और दी एफ एफ आर वट वॉज द ओम्स लॉ ओम्स लॉ स्टेटेड दैट फ्लो इज इक्वल टू प्रेशर डिवाइडेड बाई रेजिस्टेंस सो वेन द रेजिस्टेंस इज कॉन्स्टेंट चेंजेस इन प्रेशर are proportional to changes in flow what we measure is the pressure across the lesion during maximal hyperemia the aim of this hyperemia is that coronary resistance remains at its lowest and it remains constant this allows the flow to be directly related to the pressure the normal value of ffr is 1 ffr values less than 0.75 are associated with presence of inducible ischemia patients with stable cad who have a ffr values more than 0.8 have very good prognosis even without pci clinical decision making in the gray zone of ffr values between 0.75 and 0.8 is controversial however studies have shown that in patients with gray zone ffr that is between 0.75 to 0.8 revascularization can cause significant reduction of major adverse cardiovascular events as ffr is measured only at maximal hyperemia it is independent of microcirculation heart rate blood pressure and other hemodynamic variables ffr has very high reproducibility and has low intra individual variability unlike coronary flow reserve fractional flow reserve or the ffr is independent of sex or cad risk factors such as hypertension and diabetes studies have shown that ffr is not affected by pacing changes in contractility by dobutamine infusion or changes in blood pressure by nitroprusside infusion how to measure the ffr ffr is usually measured using 6 french guiding catheter the first step is giving intracoronary nitroglycerin in the dose of 100 to 200 mic before the pressure guide wire is advanced into the coronary artery the pressure sensor in the pressure guide wire is located 3 cm uh, from the tip the sensor of the pressure guide wire is introduced and it is positioned at the tip of the guiding catheter where catheter and the wire pressures are equalized after this the sensor is advanced distal to the lesion and drug for hyperemia is started it is usually iv adenosine the mean and the phasic pressures are continuously recorded and at peak hyperemia ffr is calculated the drugs which are used for inducing maximal coronary hyperemia include adenosine intracoronary nitroprusside dobutamine papaverin and reg adenosine of these adenosine is most commonly and most widely used it can be given iv or intracoronary intracoronary nitroprusside has similar hyperemic effect as compared to intracoronary adenosine papaverin is no longer used and this is because of its association with qt prolongation ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation dobutamine also is not used because it can cause increase in blood pressure and it can induce ischemia a few words about adenosine adenosine can be given both intravenously and intracoronary iv adenosine has got simple weight based dosing it is 140 microgram per kg per minute iv adenosine is the preferred hyperemic agents for evaluation of osteo lesions and for assessment of diffuse disease adenosine can also be administered intracoronary it is given in the dose of 50 to 100 micrograms in the right coronary artery and 100 to 200 micrograms in the left coronary artery for maximal hyperemia the principal advantage of adenosine is that it has got a very short half life and the blood flow returns to its basal values 30 to 60 seconds after the infusion is stopped intravenous adenosine can cause approximately 10% drop in the mean arterial pressure and symptoms of chest burning can also be seen intracoronary adenosine can cause av blocks and it can also decrease mean arterial pressure iv administration 
is more commonly associated with the side effects like flushing, chest tightness, bronchospasm, nausea, transient AV block, or bradycardia. Changes in blood pressure and heart rate have been found to be greater with intravenous adenosine. Studies have shown that intracoronary adenosine produces equivalent hyperemia. Reg adenosone is a low affinity adenosine receptor agonist. It selectively binds to alpha 2A receptor which is present in the coronary arteries and causes coronary vasodilation and increases myocardial blood flow. The hyperemia induced by a reg adenosone has been found to be equivalent to adenosine. The selective binding to adenosine receptor in the coronary arteries is responsible for fewer adverse events which are seen with reg adenosone compared to the adenosine. Reg adenosone is administered in single infusion bolus of 0.4 mg. The drawbacks which can be seen with reg adenosone include 1. It can cause tachycardia and 2nd. The exact duration of hyperemia after one dose of Reg adenosone is not known. If we can repeat the dose in the cath lab or not, it is not well studied. In future, it may prove to be a better alternative to adenosine in calculating the FFR. Intracoronary nitroproside may be an alternative to intracoronary adenosine. The dose of intracoronary nitroproside is 0.3 to 0.9 micrograms per kg. It has been found that intracoronary nitroproside produces equivalent coronary hyperemia and the duration of hyperemia produced by intracoronary nitroproside is 25% longer than that by intracoronary adenosine. Intracoronary nitroproside decreases systolic blood pressure by 20% when we compare it to intracoronary adenosine. Intracoronary adenosine has got literally no effect on parameters like heart rate and blood pressure. What we know is that FFR measured by the intracoronary nitroproside is almost identical to the FFR obtained by the intracoronary adenosine. FFR is a very useful investigation when clinical and testing data, especially angiography, are at odds with one another. As per the SCAI or the ACC AHA guidelines, FFR is a class 3 indication when clinical scenario angiogram and ischemic tests are concordant. FFR provides the objective evidence of ischemia for individual coronary lesions that require revascularization. FFR is especially useful when non-invasive testing is either absent or equivocal or does not provide objective evidence of ischemia. It has been shown that the routine use of FFR leads to change in number and location of lesions that are functionally significant. FAME trial has taught us that lesions with 50 to 70 percent narrowing are hemodynamically significant in only 35 percent of the cases. In lesions with 70 to 90 percent narrowing, for which most of the operators are going to perform PCI, 20 percent were not found to be hemodynamically significant by FFR. FFR can also guide us for the management of stable coronary artery disease. In patients with stable coronary artery disease, we might have angiographic intermediate lesion or angiographic severe lesion. In patients where there is angiographic severe lesion and stenosis is more than equal to 90%, FFR is probably not required. However, in patients with stable angina, if the lesion is between 17 to 90%, it is better to get an FFR done and if FFR is more than 0.8, medical therapy should be sufficient for the patient. If FFR is less than or equal to 0.8, then PCI is recommended in these patients. In patients with stable angina and intermediate coronary lesion, FFR is always recommended. If FFR is more than 0.8, optical medical therapy is only what is required. And if FFR is less than 0.08, then PCI should be done. FFR can also be helpful in guarding left main interventions. We'll talk about it in a while. FFR can also be used to assess the success after the percutaneous interventions. Studies have found that the higher the FFR value is after the PCA, lower is the event rate during the follow-up. A large study comprising of more than 500 patients has shown that post-PCI FFR of 0.86 is the optimal predictor of major adverse cardiovascular events during the follow-up after PCI. In patients with acute coronary syndrome, that threshold might be higher. It has been reported that the threshold for successful PCI in patients with acute coronary syndrome is 0.91. However, repeated FFR measurements are not currently recommended post-PCI if we already have the evidence of angiographic success. FFR can be used for the patients undergoing bifurcation PCI. The hemodynamic significance of side branch stenosis caused by the PCI can be assessed by FFR. In case 
the FFR is more than 0.8, no side branch intervention is required. An FFR of less than or equal to 0.8 in the side branch correlates with the increased risk of events during the follow-up. Can FFR be used in patients with acute coronary syndrome? So the answer is yes and no. In the early phase after the ST segment elevation MI, severe microvascular impairment or inflammation or stunning may be present. A low FFR still indicates hemodynamic significance of residual stenosis but a high FFR does not exclude the significant residual stenosis. Therefore, pressure derived FFR which we normally do should not be used for the culprit vessel during first five days of the ST segment elevation MI. After treatment of the culprit lesion, FFR of other stenosis can be helpful and can indicate the need for additional treatment. In patients with prior MI that is more than five days, the classical value of 0.8 can be used as threshold to indicate residual ischemia of the infarct related or the remote arteries. In the setting of unstable angina or non-ST segment elevation MI, FFR can be used if the culprit lesion is unclear or if the lesions are present in multiple vessels. It has been shown that in patients with NSTEMI or non-ST segment elevation MI, acute determination of FFR in non-culprit lesion is safe, accurate and reproducible and it correlates with non-invasive proof of ischemia or repeated FFR measurements after the acute phase. FFR can also be used in the patients who are being planned for coronary artery bypass grafting. The standard surgical practice is grafting all the vessels with angiographic stenosis more than 50%. It has been shown that bypass grafting of the vessels with hemodynamically insignificant stenosis has a higher rate of graft closure. The FFR guided bypass is a reasonable strategy to predict the bypass graft patency and it is superior over the strategy of grafting all the vessels with stenosis more than 50%. FFR is a very valuable investigation in patients who are undergoing PCI for left main coronary artery. In patients with left main coronary artery stenosis, FFR is useful before stenting and it is useful after the stenting also. Before the stenting, it allows us to estimate the hemodynamic severity of left main coronary artery disease as sometimes IVUS derived minimal luminal area may have limited accuracy. It is FFR is also useful after stenting to decide whether the side branch whether the side branch intervention is required while doing the PCI of distal left main. Sometimes the side branch may be angiographically stenosed but may be physiologically normal and the side branch we are talking about here is left circumflex. There are some important points which we need to remember while doing the FFR for left main artery, for left main coronary artery. Number one, while we are assessing the osteal left main coronary artery, guiding catheter should be disengaged. This is to avoid the dampening of the pressure. Number two, IV adenosine is the preferred hyperemic agent because it allows us to pull the guide catheter out of the ostium. Now that we understand that for assessment of osteal left main coronary artery, we have to disengage the guide catheter. It is self-explanatory that intracoronary hyperemic agents may not be the ideal choice for attaining hyperemia, making IV adenosine a better choice. Another important point to remember is that left main stenosis is very rarely isolated. It is usually associated with disease in left anterior descending or left circumflex artery. So the coexisting disease in the LAD or the circumflex will tend to increase the FFR while we are measuring it for the left main coronary artery disease. Our recommendation is to measure the FFR in the least diseased vessel, preferably the LAD with a pullback. If the FFR value is less than 0.8, revascularization should be done. It has been shown that if the FFR values are more than 0.8, there are similar outcomes between CABG and optimal medical therapy. So the intervention may be deferred. There are some authors who believe that if FFR values are between 0.8 to 
then we should not be deferring the intervention by having a look at the FFR values only and we should consider IVUS before ruling out completely the presence of significant disease. And if FFR is more than 0.85, then medical treatment should be the treatment of choice. In the DEFER trial, 325 stable ischemic heart disease patients with intermediate coronary stenosis were included. FFR was calculated in all these 325 patients. Patients who had their FFR less than or equal to 0.75 received PCI. This was our reference group in this study. Patients who had their FFR more than 0.75 were randomized to either PCI or medical therapy. PCI in patients with FFR more than 0.75, this was the treated group and medical management of the patients with FFR more than 0.75 was the deferred group. The outcomes were compared between the treated group and the deferred group. At 5 years, the risk of death and MI was similar in both deferred and treated group. The event-free survival, that is freedom from all-cause death, MI, coronary artery bypass grafting and coronary angiography was not different in treated and the deferred group. It was significantly worse in the reference group. We learn about an important concept from this that lesions that had an FFR of 0.75 or greater have very good prognosis that is not improved by PCI. Routine PCI in the setting of FFR more than 0.75 is not superior to optimal medical therapy for cardiovascular events at 5 years and at 15 years it is associated with higher risk of myocardial infarction than optimal medical therapy alone. This trial provided the long-term safety data regarding the FFR-guided approach for the management of coronary artery disease. A limitation of this study was that it enrolled the patients with relatively simple lesions from a non-contemporary era. That is, there was no use of the drug eluting stents or there was low use or lower dosage of the current drugs that we are using for the patients with coronary artery disease. In FAME 1 trial, approximately 1000 patients with multivessel CAD or disease in at least two of the coronary arteries with intermediate stenosis, that is at least 50% of stenosis were randomized to receive either angiography guided PCI or FFR guided PCI. 500 patients received angiographic PCI and 500 patients received FFR guided PCI. In the angiographic guided PCI, PCI was done for all the lesions with stenosis more than 50%. This was the angio PCI group. This was the comparator one for the study. In the FFR guided PCI group, FFR was done for all the stenosis which were more than 50%. If the FFR was less than or equal to 0.8, PCI was done. If FFR was more than 0.8, PCI was deferred and patient was started on optical medical therapy. This was the FFR PCI group and this was used as comparator 2. The FIM1 trial showed that compared to angiographic guided PCI group, the FFR guided PCI group had fewer stents per patient, lesser contrast was used, had lower procedural cost, had shorter hospital stay, and at 2 years follow up, FFR guided PCI was associated with fewer major adverse cardiovascular events, fewer combined death and myocardial infarction, and lower total number of major adverse cardiovascular events. What did we conclude from the results of FAME 1 study? We conclude that routine measurement of FFR in patients with multivessel coronary artery disease who are undergoing PCI significantly reduces the rate of composite endpoints of death, myocardial infarction and repeat revascularization. FAME 2 trial. In FAME 2 trial, approximately 900 patients with stable angina with intermediate stenosis underwent FFR. Patients who had an FFR of more than 0.8 were started on optimal medical therapy. Patients who had an FFR of less than or equal to 0.8 were randomized to receive either optimal medical therapy or PCI and comparison was run in between these two groups. In this trial, it was found that FFR guided PCI decreased major adverse cardiovascular events and it decreased rate of urgent revascularization when compared to optimal medical therapy in intermediate stenosis. FFR guided PCI was also found to be cost effective at 3 years. There was lower rate of non-urgent revascularization in patients with FFR-guided PCI. However, 
rates of death and MI were similar in both the groups. It was also found that there were higher rates of acute coronary syndrome in patients who were in medical arm. This trial strongly suggested that abnormal FFR values do not have good long-term prognosis compared to those with normal FFR values. And PCI of these lesions significantly improves outcomes. The NAMI-3 Ply Multi Study In this study, patients with ST segment elevation MI with multivessel disease who had more than one clinically significant coronary stenosis underwent PCI of the infarct-related artery. After this, patients were divided into two groups, one in which there was no further invasive treatment and second in which there was FFR-guided complete revascularization. In this study, it was found that in patients with ST segment elevation MI with multivessel disease, complete revascularization guided by FFR significantly decreased the risk of future events. That is, the composite of death, MI and revascularization. This was primarily due to decrease in repeat revascularization. Death and myocardial infarction were similar in both the groups. In the COMPARE ACUTE trial, FFR-guided multivessel PCI was tested in patients with myocardial infarction. In this study, 900 patients with ST segment elevation MI with multivessel disease who underwent PCI of the infarct-related artery were randomized into two groups. One group received complete revascularization of non-infarct-related artery which was guided by the FFR. This group comprised of approximately 300 patients. The other group was one in which there was no revascularization of non-infarct-related artery. This group comprised of approximately 600 patients. These two groups were compared and this trial found that 50% of the lesions in non-infarct-related artery which were considered significant on coronary angiography had an FFR of more than 0.8, that is, they were physiologically non-significant. What did we conclude from the results of COMPARE ACUTE trial? We came to know after the results of COMPARE ACUTE trial, in patients with ST segment elevation MI with multivessel disease, FFR guided complete revascularization of non-infarct related artery decreased the rate of future events, that is, they decreased the rate of composite of death from any cause, non-fatal MI, revascularization and cerebrovascular events. However, there was no difference in death or MI and the benefit was primarily due to decrease in future revascularization. The famous NSTEMI trial compared the FFR-guided PCI versus CAG or the coronary angiography-guided PCI in patients with non-ST segment elevation MI. In this study, patients with refractory angina, hemodynamically unstable patients, patients who were ineligible for revascularization, or who had planned valve surgery, or who previously had history of coronary artery bypass grafting, or patients with diffuse calcification, or patients with non-obstructive coronary artery disease were excluded. 170 patients were randomized to receive FFR-guided PCI, and 170 patients were randomized to angiography-guided PCI. It was found that in patients with NSTEMI, FFR-guided strategy was feasible. In around one-fifth of the patients, FFR-guided PCI change the treatment strategy. In the FFR-guided PCI group, large number of patients received optimal medical therapy only. Major adverse cardiovascular events were similar between the two groups. The authors also found that spontaneous MI was higher in the FFR-guided group and periprocedural MI was higher in coronary angiography-guided group. The FLOWER MI trial was published in May 2021 edition of NEGM. So what we know is 50% of patients with acute ST segment elevation MI have multivessel disease. What we already know is that preventive PCI or performing the complete revascularization in ST segment MI patients decreases the rate of cardiac death and non-fatal MI and subsequent angina. Flower MI trial was a multicentric randomized open label trial which was conducted from December 2016 to December 2018 in France. Patients of ST segment elevation MI who were more than 18 years of age and had undergone successful PCI of infarct-related artery. The, that uh, infarct-related artery PCI could be primary PCI, rescue PCI, or a pharmacoinvasive PCI were enrolled in the trial. The successful PCI was defined as 
टीमी स्कोर ऑफ मोर देन इक्वल टू टू और रेसिडुअल स्टेनोसिस लेस देन थर्टी परसेंट फॉर अ कल्प्रिट लीजन देर वॉज दिस एडिशनल की एलिजिबिलिटी क्राइटेरिया फॉर डिफाइनिंग मल्टीवेसल डिजीज द पेशेंट हैड टू हैव अ मेजर एपिकार्डियल कोरोनरी आर्टरी और अ मेजर साइड ब्रांच मोर देन टू एम 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 डायमीटर विथ एटलीस्ट वन लीजन ऑफ मोर देन इक्वल टू फिफ्टी परसेंट स्टेनोसिस पेशेंट्स वर एक्सक्लूडेड इफ दे हैड सिंगल वेसल डिजीज और दे हैड हिमोडाइनमिक इंस्टेबिलिटी हैड प्रीवियस कार्डिक सर्जरी और हैड कोरोनरी आर्टरी कैल्सिफिकेशन और दे वर हैविंग सी टी ओज और दे हैड फेल्ड कल्प्रेट लीजन पी सी आई और द पेशेंट्स वर एफर्ड फॉर सी ए बी जी वन इज टू वन रैंडमाइजेशन वॉज रन इन टू ग्रुप्स पी सी आई गाइडेड बाई दी एफ एफ आर एंड पी सी आई गाइडेड बाई दी एन जी ओ की प्राइमरी आउटकम वॉज अ कंपोजिट ऑफ डेथ फ्रॉम एनी कॉज नॉन फेटल एम आई और अनप्लान रीवेस्कुलराइजेशन और अनप्लान हॉस्पिटलाइजेशन लीडिंग टू अर्जेंट रीवेस्कुलराइजेशन एट वन ईयर The secondary outcomes included procedure time, total amount of contrast used, and individual components of the primary outcome like any revascularization, urgent or elective, urgent revascularization of any non-culprit artery, rehospitalization for angina or heart failure, any rehospitalization in the cardiology department, and functional class as per the Canadian classification of the angina. number of anti angina drugs and cost effectiveness were analyzed a total of 1170 patients that is close to 1200 patients with stemi and multivessel disease were enrolled in the study out of which close to 600 got enrolled in the ffr group and close to 600 got uh, got enrolled in angiography guided group approximately 66% patients in the ffr guided group had pci as compared to 97% patients in the angiography group received pci what the trial has found was among the patients with st segment elevation mi with multivessel disease who had undergone successful pci of the infarct related artery an ffr guided strategy for complete revascularization was not superior to angiography guided strategy for reducing composite primary outcome which was death non fatal mi and unplanned hospitalization the individual components of this primary outcome as well as the other secondary outcomes that are discussed previously did not differ between the two groups the ffr may not be a very good investigation for patients with st segment elevation mi because the natural history studies have already shown us that most of the acs it results from rupture or erosion of thin fibrous cap which overlies an atherosclerotic plaque And there are often such several plaques in the entire coronary tree in patient with ST segment elevation MI. A plaque at high risk of occlusion need not be obstructive to flow. Patients with STEMI may have multiple ruptured plaques that have little effect on flow. Therefore, they are underestimated by FFR in their potential to cause subsequent MI or cardiac death. Fame three trial was recently published in New England Journal of Medicine in November 2021. It was an international multicentric non-inferiority trial. In this trial, approximately 1500 patients with triple vessel disease were randomized in one is to one fashion to either receive coronary artery bypass grafting or FFR guided PCI using the zetarolimus eluting stent. The primary endpoint was major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events at one year and it was a composite of death myocardial infarction stroke and repeat revascularization this trial evaluated ffr guided pci with second generation drug eluting stents with cabg in triple vessel disease angiographic triple vessel disease without left main disease was included stenosis with ffr less than equal to 0.8 was treated with zetarolimus eluting stent which were resolute integrity or resolute onyx patients in the pci group received dual antiplatelet therapy for at least 6 months of all the patients included around 39% patients presented with history of acute coronary syndrome at one year incidence of primary endpoint was 10.6% in the ffr group and only 6.9% in the cabg group the ffr guided pci did not meet the criteria for non inferiority cabg was found to have 
लोअर इंसिडेंस ऑफ कंपोजिट ऑफ डेथ एम आई स्ट्रोक एंड रिपीट रिवेस्कुलराइजेशन एट वन ईयर दैन एफ एफ आर गाइडेड पी सी आई हाउ एवर वन थिंग टू नोटिस दैट एफ एफ आर गाइडेड पी सी आई फेयर बेटर दैन सी ए बी जी इन सम सेफ्टी इन पॉइंट्स द पेशेंट्स इन सी ए बी जी आम हैड लॉन्गर हॉस्पिटल स्टे हैड हायर इंसिडेंस ऑफ मेजर ब्लीड्स मोर चांसेस ऑफ अरिदमिया मोस्ट कॉमनली एट्रल फिबुलेशन मोर चांसेस ऑफ एक्यूट किडनी इंजरी एंड मोर चांसेस ऑफ री हॉस्पिटलाइजेशन इन थर्टी डेज एंड द एफ एफ आर गाइडेड पी सी आई ग्रुप हैड लेसर मेजर ब्लीड्स लेसर इंसिडेंस ऑफ एट्रल फिबुलेशन लेसर इंसिडेंस ऑफ एक एक्यूट किडनी इंजरी एंड लेसर इंसिडेंस ऑफ रिपीट थर्टी डे हॉस्पिटलाइजेशन देर वॉज समथिंग इंटरेस्टिंग इन दी सब ग्रुप एनालिसिस ऑल्सो इन द पेशेंट्स विथ हायर सिंटेक स्कोर सी ए बी जी वॉज फाउंड टू बी मच बेटर दिन एफ एफ आर गाइडेड पी सी आई एंड इन पेशेंट्स विथ लोअर सिंटेक्स स्कोर एफ एफ आर गाइडेड पी सी आई वॉज फाउंड टू बी मच बेटर दैन सी ए बी जी इन टर्म्स ऑफ वन ईयर मेजर एडवर्स कार्डियो वैस्कुलर एंड सेरबिरो वैस्कुलर इवेंट्स वॉट आर द इम्पॉर्टेंट टेक होम मैसेजेस फ्रॉम दिस फेम थ्री ट्रायल इम्पॉर्टेंट मैसेजेस फ्रॉम दिस ट्रायल इज दैट एफ एफ आर गाइडेड पी सी आई यूजिंग करेंट जनरेशन ड्रग इल्यूटिंग स्टेंट इज स्टिल नॉट नॉन इन्फीरियर टू सी ए बी जी इन पेशेंट्स विद ट्रिपल वेसल डिजीज ऑल्सो फ्रॉम सब ग्रुप एनालिसिस वी लर्न दैट देर इज सम बेनिफिट ऑफ पी सी आई इन पेशेंट्स विद लो सेंटेक्स स्कोर बिटवीन जीरो टू ट्वेंटी टू इन कंक्लूजन एफ एफ आर इज अ सिंपल ईजी टू परफॉर्म इन्वेस्टिगेशन इंडिपेंडेंट ऑफ द बेस लाइन फ्लो एंड इट हैज गॉट लो वेरिएबिलिटी एफ एफ आर कैन बी मेजर्ड सक्सेसफुली इन मोस्ट ऑफ द आर्टरीज एंड द मेजरमेंट्स आर एक्सट्रीमली रिप्रोड्यूसिबल कंपेयर विद अदर इन्वेसिव इन असेसमेंट एफ एफ आर इज यूनिक एंड हैज वैल्यूएबल कैरेक्टरिस्टिक विद अ नॉर्मल वैल्यू ऑफ वन इन ऑल द पेशेंट्स एंड इन ऑल द कोरोनरी आर्टरीज एफ एफ आर वैल्यूज आर नॉट अफेक्टेड बाई चेंज इन हार्ट रेट ब्लड प्रेशर और माओकार्डियल कॉन्ट्रेक्टिलिटी एफ एफ आर कैन एक्यूरेटली आइडेंटिफाई द हीमोडाइनमिक सिग्निफिकेंस इन एनी एपिकार्डियल कोरोनरी आर्टरी इट मे प्रोवाइड द फंक्शनल सिग्निफिकेंस फॉर एनी लीजन स्पेशली इन प्रेजेंस ऑफ मल्टी वेसल कोरोनरी आर्टरी डिजीज इट इज अजफुल इन्वेस्टिगेशन इन पेशेंट्स विद इंटरमीडिएट लीजन्स एफ एफ आर इज ऑल्सो हेल्पफुल फॉर असेसमेंट ऑफ बाइफरकेशन एंड इट अवॉइड्स अननेसेसरी साइड ब्रांच स्टेंटिंग However there are some limitations which are associated with it and they include that one it is an invasive test number two it requires pharmacological vasodilation and adenosine may not be well tolerated by every patient and number three ffr values can be affected by some pathologic factors like the downstream disease in patients with left main coronary artery disease